Hi, my name is Deborah Stack. I'm a lead technical instructor in mixed media textiles at the Royal College of Art. Um, I've actually worked here for 23 years, um, mainly in a part-time capacity, but I became um, sort of four days a week, um, all year round, about three or four years ago. And um, I'm a lead technical instructor, so I run the workshop, which is on the fifth floor in Kensington. Um, and it's mainly textile processes that we have here, but we do have some other processes as well. For example, we have um, no sew equipment. We also have um, a high frequency welder, which enables you to weld plastics. And we have uh, things like a tufting gun. So this is the frame that I'm sitting in front of now. Um, and behind me is some sort of student tests that we've been working on with students. Um, I guess I did a textile design degree, and then after I graduated, I uh, freelanced, and then I got a job working um, with Karen Nicholl, who is a professor here, and then um, somebody retired, and then they asked me to come and work here. I was also a technician at UAL, so I was there for about seven years, um, and what I learned in my BA was just like the starting point of what I know now, obviously, in textiles. And through my freelance work, I've done lots of other things too. So I think that's all been like really good experience for me. But day to day working in the workshop, I guess we um, work with students in lots of different ways. Um, we've sort of adjusted our offer um, since the pandemic and lockdown. Obviously, that. Um, meant that some of us were put on furlough and some of us were actually then um, kept and we had to sort of flip our teaching model. So it used to be very much like in the workshop, always just very sort of physical one-to-one -one sort of demonstrations or inductions. But then we then had this whole sort of online world open to us. We had started to sort of experiment a little bit with some online resources, but that actually then meant that we were sort of actually relying on that solely as our mode of delivery which was very interesting and challenging, but actually also really great in terms of reflecting on your teaching practice and how you deliver information. And I think it really helped um, for us to really sort of analyse how we deliver information and the different learning styles and how we can accommodate and, you know, and give access to everybody. So I guess um, some of the online elements have really stayed. So um, also we have um, got an increase in cohort of students, so again, working out the best way to deliver, to continue to offer a really sort of high quality sort of you know service and delivery to them. So we, as I said, have different modes. Um, we often will start with a consultation, which is online, so like 15 minutes, you can book that for an online platform that's in college, and then that would be just an initial meeting to sort of talk about um, students can come from all areas of college, so they may be completely unfamiliar with textiles, or they may have, may have like quite deep knowledge already. So we just try and get a sort of common ground, find out what their project is, how we can uh, sort of um, facilitate them, and then we would work out access routes. And um, also, obviously, if students have um, English not as their first language, we may. Um, they can use like closed captioning, they can use other sort of methods to understand you know, the, the instruction because it can be technical language, which we do try and make sure that it's sort of quite simple so um, nobody feels sort of overwhelmed or excluded. And then we also run um, inductions in person. So for example, this year with the one year MA, uh, we have a cohort just in textiles of about 130 students. And um, we basically were delivering um, blocks of inductions. So in the room, we have lots of different um, types of equipment. They are based in stitch, but they're lots of different modes. So some of them will do sort of texture stitches. Some of them will do like, you can sort of draw with a needle. Um, some is software. Some are just, you know, um, welding, as I mentioned before. So what we do is we grouped them into sort of coded machines, because here we have a health and safety aspect where we have um, red coded, orange coded, and green coded. And green coded is the most accessible once the students have had induction. So we grouped them so that the green coded machinery was in one induction, the orange was in another, and then we also um, run, ran a slightly different induction as well. So, for example, if people wanted to use a specific piece of equipment, 
just on its own, then we can do like ad hoc sort of uh, dotted in around. So some of it was very timetabled, some of it's literally emails or consultations were fitted in. And then um, we also just have lots of different ways of sort of working with the students. Um, discussions, feedback, often, for example, with the digital embroidery, um, that's a different access route. We have online resources for them, for the students to look at, first of all, um, and that's sort of explaining how to use the software. We also point them in the direction of tutorials that are online that already exist. Um, some of them we've made ourselves, and then from that they would get an understanding. We say that they can book in one-to-one -one with us as well, if they need more support. Um, that can either be online or in person. And um, then we ask them to come in, and then we go through the process of them making a design, and then taking it from the software design stage, so very much on the screen, to then 3D, sorry, not 3D, 2D. It can be 3D if they want to then make it into something else. For example, one of the students there is making lots of components that she's then going to sew together to make a sort of three-dimensional sort of object. So, yeah, it can, it can be lots of different things. What do you like best about working in this space? Um, I like the way I've sort of got it now. <laughs> I mean, I've been very fortunate that I have moved around college and I moved into this space about two years ago and I was involved in the planning of the space. So that meant I could sort of have quite a big say in, you know, the workflows, um, how it looked. So that's meant that I think I've got real ownership of it. Um, also, I think we're very fortunate where we are. Um, maybe if you go around the room, you'll see that we are. We've got the park. Like that's just every day. It's very, you never get bored of that view. We say to ourselves, but it's just in a really nice place. It feels got a nice feeling in here. Um, because I've been here for a long time, I've got quite a big um, catalogue, back catalogue of sort of examples of work that we've done over the years. And I think that to me is like one of the most invaluable teaching sort of resources that I have, that I've got little physical examples that I can literally show to somebody and say this. And I think, again, you know, if there's a quiet moment, sometimes I will sit down and think, right, I'll just do, I'll just work. Like last week, I just did a little quick sample because I found something and thought, oh, I'll just put that together. And already this morning a student has picked it up and said, oh, what's this? So I think that sort of ability to, you know, it's, it is obviously, time management is good, but it's really good to just have lots of things that the students can look at, because so I think that's really inspirational for them. Yeah. How does that work? With You were talking about the fact that there's now a lot more happening online, yeah. as well as them coming in, and that students from across the college can come to you. So how... Yeah, I'm wondering about that kind of the tactility and the chance of seeing something. How does that work if people aren't coming into the space as much? So tactility, that is that is one of the most difficult things to translate, I think. I think I'm quite good at describing, and obviously even on Zoom I will sort of hold something up, but then again I do try and encourage people to come, even if it's just to pass by and just have a look at things, just so that they can get a sense of that. Because you can talk about, you know, the pressure of something, the tension, you know, like for example, when we're doing this, we have to talk about how tension the fabric is, but it's really difficult to then actually translate that to sort of an online consultation. You can describe it, but I think until a lot of people do the actual process, yeah, that, that bit is something that I would like to see developed more of. I think we will talk about sort of haptic experiences, you know, in online, but yeah, I think that would be amazing. <laughs> It's a whole research project. <laughs> and how much, because you've been working at the LCA for a long time, so you've worked with a lot of different students, have you seen particular sort of changes or shifts in what students want to make or their attitude to making? I think I would say that maybe sort of ambition and scale sometimes. It will, maybe not. It depends. I think it depends. I know that they have a lot of other projects. I think people are much more mindful about what they're making. So I think it's not just creating for creating's sake. I think they're really mindful about what materials they're using, what's going to happen to this at the end. Like we also in the space are much more mindful of that too. Like making sure that if we have got waste, we're trying to reuse it or trying to repurpose it. And also, but I think there's something to be said for making to, you know, something happens unexpectedly. 
And that sort of process of thinking then can spark another idea. And I think sometimes if that's restricted, then it, is, it does make it difficult. But it's but getting the balance between that and having the time to do that as well. So I guess, like I was saying with my sampling, sometimes I think I almost do sometimes fill in that gap myself because I maybe have got a bit more time sometimes to do those things. But yeah, I think the students, I would say that um, because they come from a really wide range of backgrounds, they don't all come with that intrinsic textile knowledge that maybe they did when they had done that straight route. But again, I don't find that necessarily, I think it's just a challenge that you have to just adapt to. I think it's really good that, you know, I, I'm fine when an architecture student or a painting student will come and they don't have that knowledge because I've got that knowledge and I can impart that to them. So, you know, and we can sort of move on further. So, but yeah, I think it's, you know, it's just really good to have a range of, of sort of backgrounds really. Just one question. Um, yeah. You mentioned that you um, were involved in the process of designing the space. So yeah. thinking about designing a space for making, what is that based on? Is that based on an ideal space for the students or the apparatus? Does that resonate with their, with um, uh, with kind of professional spaces outside of education? How did you go about designing the space for making? I think what. I mean, we are restricted by certain apparatus. For example, the digital embroidery machines had to be put into one room together because they are really noisy. So you're thinking about sort of creating spaces that, you know, can work. And we do say to the students when they're in there, you know, they, like for example in here, this is a separate room because you have to wear, um, because this can be really, the compressor can be really noisy, the actual action of tufting is noisy. And also fibres, so this had to be contained as well. But I really wanted, I sort of designed the room before I had the equipment, which is probably not helped me to do it. <laughs> I knew that I intended that we would get one. So, um, also, we inherited the space next door, which is a small, sort of, it's not an office, but it's a space where we can work if we need to step out, and, you know, that's quite good for the staff. But in terms of this, I think it was just the sort of flow. So, having a central space where people can lay out their work, I think I've always had that, like whenever I've worked elsewhere, like it's it's quite key to have somewhere where you can just put things out. And I think sometimes that's forgotten. Like it's you know very much if you're working on a machine, you, that you might be working on something really large. And also to have some sort of adaptability. So for example, um, going back again to we had an architecture student who wanted to make a really big piece of work, but he was using a domestic sewing machine. But we actually just plugged it in above table so it meant that he had the whole table to work on so he wasn't restricted by the size of the you know the machine so yeah some adaptability as well so again you know we have drop down power so you can put things in other places in the room but equally the machines are sort of around the edge so you're not distracted by what's everything's going on but you know you you have got you've got focus too so yeah I did make quite a lot of considerations when I was doing it. It sounds like you also have to do quite a lot of problem solving. Yes. Is that a big part of your day? Yeah, that's mainly what I do every day. Yeah. <laughs> but I like it, you know, and I think that helps me, just personally, as and I I think again then you build up this experience of, you know, there's a you can go back to something that maybe it's not going to be the same, but it's a similar situation that you may have come across before. So you can reference that problem. And then also curiosity which is obviously one of our values but it's just like let's try it if I have come across something I haven't done before then I will just try and see what we can do you know and the machines here have got limits but I'm willing to sort of know you know I'm, I don't want to break things because that obviously affects lots of people but I'm actually willing to try things out always yeah I'm Ian Hunter um, within the RCA, I'm an associate lecturer on the interior design program. So I teach on one of the three platforms, which is called Super Matter. And this is a material driven design platform. So ordinarily within architecture and interiors, people tend to look at the spatial aspects first and then apply materials as an afterthought. So we tend to reverse that process and try to have materials used to drive a design rather than second. 
and outside, that was the other part of it, wasn't it? Yes, yeah. so sorry, and outside of that, um, a director of a company called Materials Council, which is um, what I do most of my time, so I'm four days a week as Ian Hunter Materials Council, and then one day a week at the RCA. So Materials Council is a creative materials consultancy, so we work mainly in the architecture and design world, um, and we support professional designers to source, select, and specify materials on projects. Um, either we work, to say, directly on projects with a given problem, or now we do a lot more work at a, at a kind of more strategic level and giving them the, the rules, processes, and procedures to help them to pick materials um, a lot now. Originally, it was kind of much more aesthetic or more innovative approaches, but now it's, it's, it's all around the environment. It's, it seems to be what everybody's obsessed with. Can you tell us a bit about the space that we're in? Sure, sure. So this is um, our office and studio. So we work here, but also this is like a, a physical repository, I guess, of our, our knowledge in finding all of these wonderful materials and samples and manufacturers. So it's, it's kind of like a, a physical record, but it's also like an, an inspiration space, kind of like a, a memory palace, right? Um, so it is organised by material type, primarily. So that's how we bunch things together. So we've got woods, glass, metals, stone, textiles, concrete. If you can make a building from it, there'll be a piece of it in here. Um, as a space, it's not open to the students, which um, is problematic in some ways, but it just it just doesn't work. Um, I think from just pure scale and size, right? as you can see, it's, it's a little bit compact. And so really we've, we've had to find different ways of leveraging the contents of this so the students can can benefit from this space. Maybe, yeah, can you tell us a bit about how that works then? How do students engage with the materials if they, if they can't physically come in here? We have to take things out to them. And so it's, you know, we either if you have having a tutorial one-to-one -one with students, sometimes we'll bring them in here and we can go through the shelves and pull things out. Or I'll, I'll be having a discussion or a fellow tutor will, and we can run in here and grab you know, some physical samples and take them to them, which then help the discussion. Mm. Um, I mean, I think it would be better if the students had access to this space, but there's just a logistical issue of, of space and management. So we're always, always balancing that. But I mean, I truly, truly believe that you can't fundamentally understand materials without physically engaging with them and that's why having access to this breadth of physical samples is always super useful and I think students are always a little bit um, and professional designers as well to be honest a little bit um, narrow-minded in what's available and out there and I think just you know seeing the, the breadth of material options here encourages them to think I guess with more specificity and um, I don't know, go off the beaten track a bit more. Um, how long has it taken to build up this collection? So this collection is probably the consequence of about, well, the company's been formed for about 13 years, and, and this collection's been building up a little bit before then actually, so let's say 13 to 15 years, I think, to build this up. Wow. So it's kind of, um organically assembled so there wasn't a grand plan obviously we knew the material categories we wanted to fill and then we just find interesting examples of materials in that type but it's it's more just what we come across either that we've been challenged in a project as we've done research or you know from our, our kind of ongoing research trade fairs magazines websites talking to people and yeah so it's a, a bricolage i guess you'd say <laughs> Um, in a minute, minute ago, you talked about the importance, um, in your opinion, of the kind of haptic encounter with the material mm -hmm. in order to understand its properties and its possibilities. I see you've got a small photographic studio in the corner. Yeah. Could you tell us about uh, what you use that for and if the and how you try and document and translate some of the materials uh, or communicate some of the materials through images, if, if at all? 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, it's always a really interesting question, this, and, and it's one we've been trying to address as a company for a long time. Um, so we made a, a digital database, a materials library software, and that's to help um, designers and architects to be able to find the materials they need for the job. And so everything is here physically, but we also digitize it so people can access it remotely or they can do either desk-based research, entering criteria that they want, be it, you know, slip resistance, fire retardancy, scale, color, gloss level, whatever it might be. We're um, fastidious in the amount of uh, data and categories we use. So you can do desk-based research and then use that to come and find this in our library or their own. So our system is obviously in a number of um, large-scale architectural practices. Or the other way around, you can find something and want to know what it is and you can scan it. And then it brings up the digital data sheet and tells you about that product or material, what its affordances are, what it does. Um, so as part of that is, is the photography. As you saw, we have the corner there, so we take, take a lot of pride in the kind of um, quality and accuracy of this. These images we're all still very visual people and so that one allows people to search for things visually for the aesthetic qualities they can also use these assets in their, their reports as well um, which is all super super helpful to them but I think you know photography is just just one element I think is the key point I want to make so it's, it's an image plus lots of data we do at the moment we're kind of much more on the um, objective qualities, so it's it's much more physical properties and it's physical capabilities and less on the like, semantic or semiotic side of things, which I think is quite something that we're much more interested in academically than professionally, to be honest, before. Talk to us less about the emotional qualities of materials professionally, but that's, that's kind of um, what I always enjoy through teaching as we get to engage that side of things more. Thank you. And there's another question. Mm -hmm. um, one's imagination certainly gets sparked from being in the room and the, the majority of the materials are cut in kind of relatively kind of hand mm -hmm. size um, uh, uh, um, samples. samples. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. Do you have any examples that you could articulate verbally now of some projects that have maybe taken you by surprise or some unexpected unexpected results that came from came from students using taking the material from here as a sample and then and then that transforming into something uh any kind of memorable projects yeah yeah i mean many well luckily enough this this one in front of me is not not too bad an example as it happens which then uh, wasn't planted but That'll work very nicely. <laughs> so this was one of our students last year. Um, so again, obviously, matter we always start with the material. So there's, there's many projects that we could talk about. Um, so this one was an investigation of um, waste initially in questioning that. And then Dylan, the student, looked at um, packaging materials and the amount of waste. And then could that be reformed into a construction material? So she really explored paper pulp and how this could be used as, as a construction material interior only obviously as bricks. Um, another one was one of my students last year um, and he got fascinated and obsessed by straw and so what's interesting is you begin with this one raw material and then as you can see in this there's hundreds of different forms this material can be manifested in. And so we explored the various different uses of straw within a project, you know, from the kind of emotional side, making something feel natural, sustainable, organic, but also to the technical properties, like it's um, fantastic acoustically, a great thermal insulator, but then you can solve the problems of um, rotting, pests, insects, these kind of things. It's considered an end of life. Actually, and the beautiful thing was at the end of the life, uh, farm animals would come in and eat, eat the building. Which is quite nice. So they, there are two that spring to mind. Mm. But I think yeah, most most of our projects, or at least the good ones, should should have an element of that to it. Mm. Thank you um, so much. Another question: How I presume you have some students that, are, that already know um, the specifications of the project and the type of material they would like. Do you have any? How do you assist? students to navigate this kind of wonderful archive of materials if they don't know what they're looking for because I one would imagine that 
on the one hand, your space can be an inspiring. On the second hand, it can be overwhelming in terms of, so how do you have any ways or strategies in which you help students navigate navigate uh navigate your your knowledge and your and and, and uh yeah your your knowledge 100 yeah. percent. yeah no, that's a very very good question and point that it is is quite overwhelming in a way um <laughs> so when you say students who know what they want is actually probably more more challenging because often they're ignorant or naive in a way right and i think it's actually drilling down into what it is that they want in helping them articulate that so if they can speak in a descriptive way so we always um, interrogate them in terms of what they're trying to achieve so what does it have to do physically and what does it have to do you know from a perceptive standpoint and again once we have that conversation then we can pull things out and again having access to things then we can discuss some of the physical so again say you wanted to pick a material which had good environmental qualities but also spoke of sustainability so would this be a good option? I think perhaps it might, you know, because it has a potentially sustainable aesthetic. Whereas, I don't know, something like this might be a little more, um, I guess its properties are hidden and you have to scratch away the surface to understand why it has environmental merit, so to speak. So I guess yet yeah, conversation really getting them to articulate what it is they're trying to do and then speaking directly about examples about how material A achieves that and what doesn't and how material B does that doesn't, I guess, would be a typical process. Hello, my name is Melanie Sapin and I'm a Dark Room Technician at the World College of Art, I'm, which is based in the Dark Room and the studio spaces are based in the Dyson building um, in Battersea on the second floor and the third floor. Um, on the second floor we have um, moving image spaces, um, studios with lights, um, uh, computers, um, cameras, next, and next door we've also got a resource store with um, cameras and equipment that one can borrow to be able to use in the studio as well as outside so you can borrow a, a lot of the equipment that could be sound equipment, uh, photography, camera, lighting equipment. Um, and then next door to that, we've got our dark rooms. We've got a wet um, area and a dry area. So the wet areas will include processing um, black and white and processing color. In our pro um, processing color, uh, processing color, we've got a joyware machine which aids in um, keeping the temperature at a certain point to be able to process um, our films properly. Um, and then also we've got a black and white processing um, chemistry. All of it is made um, at, the, at the beginning of the day and then throughout the day um, it's used by different students and people are able to experiment, kind of process the right way or they can also experiment and think about sustainability and think about the kind of equip um, materials and um, chemicals we're, we, we're using and seeing and thinking about the future of that and whether they could actually use water and replacement for certain things. And then um, we've got our printing spaces. So we've got a dark green, black and white print space with three and uh, with four enlarges at varying sizes. Um, the we've got we can print up to 50 inches, so that is 127 centimeters wide. Um, about as long as as but as long as you would like. Um, so we've got, and then we've also got some color printing facilities as well. And we've also got um, four dedicated, um, four dedicated enlarges. And with color printing on like black and white, we've got a machine that helps aid in the processing area. So once you uh, once you um, expose your image, you'll take that out of the room and then go into another room and process it through a machine. And that's because the color processing requires a temperature, the, the a regulated temperature. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks, Mel. Class, Sorry. Yeah. class, two questions. Thanks. Uh, two questions, please, Mel. So, firstly, um. 
um, just on what you recently mm -hmm. said. So there's obviously lots of layers and processes that take place, uh, including temperatures, um, uh, various kind of nuanced kind of layers in the photographic space. How could you tell us a little bit about the type of student that you might ordinarily get on the photography MA photography, and are they, do they ordinarily arrive being very familiar with the darkened space, or do you have to, um, or do you have students that are totally unfamiliar with that? And how do you induct them, and how many students do you have to induct? Can you tell us a little bit about the process? Yeah. Um, so in this year, I believe we've got about 120 photography students, and so at the beginning, in October, we inducted everyone through all the processes. So that was working with um, studio, like working in the studio, using cameras, um, processing film, um, colour in black and white, as well as printing colour in black and white and then scanning, we've got different types of scanning, so we also go through an orientation with that. Um, and that was full on for four, five weeks of inducting those students. Probably say that um, there was a large number of people who were familiar with photography, but had never worked in the dark room. Um, and it was really interesting to see having different people at different um, kind of understanding. So either people, um, have had a history of studying photography or worked in photography um, and then also trying to cater to those who have never um, worked in a darkroom before or even understand what a, a, or a um, film is. Um, so, and then we've also got, had inductions for the rest of the college, so anyone who's interested in working in the darkroom or working in the studios has the opportunity to sign on and we get inducted in that throughout the year. Um, yeah. Brilliant, thank you. A follow-up question. After those inductions, which I presume are repeated and iterative for lots of students, as you say, mm -hmm. in thinking about making in the darkroom, in the darkrooms and in photography spaces, after the inductions, during that particular time of the year, how do you assist, like, Ordinarily, how do you assist, how do you spend your time with students? So could you just tell us a bit about how you assist students in making and the type of, the type of help that students need? Yeah, um, so the type of help that people need is so varying because we have so many people coming through. Um, so let's say traditionally if I've done an induction, someone's already um, signed up, done an induction and they know they work with digital photography but are interested in uh, working in the darkroom most of the time people would have an idea of what they want to do in either they've seen images or they like certain types of artists so they'll give us an example of the kind of work they want to make and then we can then um kind of use that as a starting point so let's say for example, today, someone came over and was interested in working with luminary prints. They'd never done work in the darkroom before, so I've, I had to actually explain what luminary uh, prints were, but also what working in the darkroom meant and what the type of paper and the choice of paper and um, what light did in terms of why the significance of like a darkroom paper and its it's sensitivity to light, so then they had a better understanding when they went outside to make an, uh, to make a print. So um, it's it can be a bit tricky because you can assume that someone has an understanding of like the kind of basics understanding, but then they might already be at an advanced level, and then you'd need to kind of go back to the starting point to really build on the foundation and try to understand like how it might work. So I think working in the dark room is very much about what, what sensitivity, um, how do you um, control light and um, what happens if you like block out, um, have a, a black box and then you start to put light in it um, for, for a different duration of time. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Hopefully that makes sense. I'm sorry. sorry. Class one, <laughs> brilliant. Class one, last question, yeah. please. Five minutes ago, you you talked about 
the right way. I suppose the kind of tradition, I think you referred to it the right way. Yeah. So thinking about traditions and sustainability, that's, that seems really interesting. So um, could you tell us a little bit about the what's been happening in the last five years, I suppose, in terms of the culture of the darkroom, in terms of traditional uh, materials and processes and and uh, and and uh, methodologies which um, which are more sustainable yeah or which come under the umbrella of kind of sustainability and photography yeah um, traditionally photography is been very unsustainable in its practice um, when working in the dark room we use a lot of water um, and we use a lot of chemis chemicals that are made to make things uh, to fix for a long period of time so we work with silver and so um, and often on are things that over a long period of time isn't actually good for one's health or like once we throw a lot of chemicals away, if we're not re um, trying to extract the silver from it, it just co continues to like, pollute the environment to an extent over a very long period of time, of course. Um, also thinking about the life of photography at the moment, where working in the darkroom, um, a lot of the suppliers, let's say Ilford or Kodak, um, are producing less um, less film, less chemistry, or a lot of sanctions have been placed up to the kind of materials that they can use within the product. Um, there is a larger demand of a lot of um, the chemicals, but also thinking about sustainability and being able to continue to make work within photography that um, on a moral level, depending on what you're interested in, um, is not bad for the environment or you know that you're not contribu contributing to um, kind of global warming or kind of polluting rivers. Um, a lot of people have been working with, instead of working with developer, they're making their own developers at home. So using coffee or using um, plant-based um, developers, which is, which you can get um, the same high quality, it's just that it takes a little bit longer and it also allows you to like, fully understand what you're putting into making your images and I think that could also be said about what people choose to consume as well. Um, and then also instead of using stock, you end up using water because it does exactly the same thing, it just slows down the process a little bit longer. So thinking about what the chemicals are doing and finding alternatives that could also speak to making sure that um, our practice is very sustainable and also we don't feel guilty about the amount of water we're using or the amount of all the kind of chemicals that um, we're using in spite of what our beliefs could be. Thank you. <laughs> But I want to put a bean bag. That's one thing I really want to bring. <laughs>